Okay, so let's talk about sexuality in young adulthood. I got a nice blurry picture of people at a party that look like young adults to me. Um, this uh, stage of life is identified as between 18 and about 45 years of age. That's a pretty wide age bracket. In developmental psychology, we've started to break it down as 18 to 25, we call that emerging adulthood, and then 25 to, uh, well, pretty much retirement is just regular adulthood. Um, I'm lumping it together following the more human sexuality approach, which is, okay, so you've reached the age of majority, so you can, in every state, you can give consent for sex. Um, and then I've got it going through 45 because that's sort of the breakoff point where we start to move into issues where fertility is going to be reduced, um, menopause for women, stuff like that. So this is like your peak reproductive years, your peak um, sexual behavior years. Um, and it's your peak sexual behavior years because um, we tend to be in the best physical condition of our lives between 18 and 45. You know, you were maturing into it up till 18, and technically you probably shouldn't have been having sex prior to that, right? And then after 45, you know, we could still look awesome, but we're not necessarily the peak of our fitness anymore. There are lots of partners available during these age brackets, you know, who, um, you know, for us to mate up with or to have hookups with or whatever. Um, we're adults. So we can say yes to things. We can, we're consenting adults finally. Yay, we might have our own apartment and things like that. The longer a couple is in a relationship, it doesn't matter what kind of relationship, the longer they're in a relationship, frequency will decline. This is something that we know. So 18 to 45, you're in your highest rate of sexual activity. But once you enter into any kind of monogamous relationship, it's going to um, peak initially and then start to, you know, wane as, you know, life. So, some sex differences in young adulthood sexuality. Males, I tried to make a little male sign here with my PowerPoint shapes, <laughs> tend to be more sexually active. They tend to report having had more partners. They tend to report having engaged in a wider variety of sexual positions. They tend to report that they masturbate more often and they tend to reach their peak of sexual um, frequency earlier. So on average around 19 is the peak of orgasm per day that males report. Females, we could just put less next to all those so I won't waste your time, but I will point out that there's a double standard of sexual behavior for females. Um, males oftentimes are expected to be sexually active, want a lot of partners, want a lot of variety, masturbate all the time, think about sex all the time. They're expected to be like that and encouraged to be like that. Whereas for females, um, they're expected to not be promiscuous. They're expected not to have a lot of sexual partners or interest or frequent masturbation. I found this on the internet. Slut. A woman with the morals of a man. Um, right? So, yeah, there still, even today, exists a double standard. I heard a speech about how the Jersey Shore, uh, which is thankfully not on MTV anymore, right? But, you know, they're always about the hookup, right? And getting it in and stuff like that. But when the girls behaved like that, the boys would give them a hard time when the girls in the sh in the house would bring home various guys um, and have sex with them and send them off in the morning, the guys would give the girls a hard time about it, And but the boys did it all the time. So uh, we may be modern and stuff, but it's still a pretty common um, double standard. Here's an example from a study that was done in 2013 where they um, had male participants in the blue bars and uh, female participants in the red bars and then they asked them uh, if if men hook up or have sex with lots of people, I respect them less. Or if women hook up or have sex with a lot with lots of people, I respect them less. They gathered the participants together based on uh, their sort of attitudes about things. So egalitarian conservatives versus liber uh, egalitarian liberals versus traditional double standard versus reverse double standard. And what they found is that people who in general seem to be egalitarian conservatives, 
um, where they see the sexes as equal, but they're kind of conservative in their viewpoints. The female participants um, were more likely to agree that they would respect a person less if they had sex with lots of people. Um, whereas the males were less likely than the females, but it's still a pretty high rate of agreement with that in the egalitarian conservatives. The egalitarian liberals, the males look a lot like the egalitarian conservatives, but the egalitarian liberal females um, were much less likely than the, uh, than the egalitarian conservative females to agree that if a person had lots of sex, I would respect them less. In the traditional double standard, you see that the males agreed with that if it was uh, a, a female, but not with a male having sex with lots of people, whereas the females um, reported um, respecting a person less if they were having, were less likely to, re to, to report that they respected the person less. That was a total double less less, wasn't it, um, in the traditional double standard. The reverse double standard, if it was a, a male who was having sex with a lot of people, we respect them less, but if it's a female, we don't really want to judge. Um, so you see different kinds of people holding kind of different attitudes about promiscuity for the two sexes. Um, from a different study, same year, we have male participants and female participants again. Those who were in a committed relationship um, and having sex, everybody approved of that, right? How acceptable is it to have sex in a committed relationship? Men and women were like, yeah, that's fine. In the casual dating first date scenario, males were more likely to say that it was okay to have sex than the women were. So um, the women thought it was okay for um, women to have sex in a committed relationship or for men to have sex in a committed relationship. The men thought it was okay for a woman in a committed relationship or a man in a committed relationship to have sex. For the men, they thought it was okay for, the, for a man to have sex in a casual dating first date scenario but not the women in a casual dating first date scenario and women agreed with that too men slightly okay to have sex in a casual dating first date um, but not for women it's a little bit more pronounced for the men in the casual dating first date scenario but pretty much a couple of year old data two different studies suggest that there's still alive and well a double standard about who it's you know whether it's okay to be promiscuous or not how about some adult intimate relationships? Cohabitation. Um, cohabitation means living with somebody of the other sex who, with whom you have a romantic relationship. So what we see is across time a huge increase in the rates of cohabitation. In fact, to the point where now it's pretty much considered a, a, a developmental stage in um, you know to go from dating to um, now that we're young adults pooling resources and living together. And a lot of people think that it's a way of, um, you know, sorting out whether this partner would actually be good, a good partner over the long term. But Pew in 2011 found that 69% of current cohabitors plan to marry their cohabiting partner. So it's not really that much of a test if you are planning to marry that person and then you've moved in in the meantime. It's more like we've just taken a step towards uh, marriage. So it looks like partners are starting to regard cohabitation as a natural step in the progression of a romantic relationship. Now here's a cautionary tale. The CDC in 2013 reported that 20% of women become pregnant within a year of becoming uh, beginning cohabitation. Um, so most don't, but that's a significant portion of women who enter into cohabitation clearly as a step towards the next step. Usually they're not moving in thinking, and then I hope I get pregnant. And yet 20% of women become pregnant as soon as they start, start having unfettered access to sex with their partner. So it's kind of a cautionary tale about if you're moving in to find out whether you want to marry this person, you might actually now be sharing your lives with this um, person, even if you decide not to marry them. The average cohabitation lasts 22 months. Um, after three years of cohabitation, about 40% of the couples will have married. Um, so, but 32% are still cohabiting at the end of three years. Now, if you do the math, that leaves roughly 30% who have broken up. So if it's a test on the way to getting married, it either can be a really, really long test, right? Because you, 32% um, are still cohabiting after three years or, um, 
it's a delay. It may not be a test as much as it is a step towards something and it's sort of we're delaying the decision making. 40% marry, 60% are either still cohabiting or broke up. Um, so let's talk about marriage. Uh, one in four of today's young adults may never marry. This is a huge change compared to previous generations. If you look at, um, so what we see in this chart is, um, if you look at the very bottom left, it says that they were 25 to 34 in 1960, and then they were 45 to 54 in 1980. So basically what you're seeing at each of these data points, um, so the dark blue is those people who are 25 to 34 in 1960. In the teal blue bar, it's people who were 25 to 34 in 1970. Then we go to the people who are that same age in 1980 and so on, 1990 and 2000. Um, and then we follow them at two different data points, ending in their um, 45 to 54 is the third data point for each group. And the prediction over on the far right that's in dotted lines may or may not come true. So we don't know. we got to wait. Um, but what you see of the known data that's already been established is that uh, if you were not married by 25 to 34 in 1960, you were probably married within the next 15 to 20 years. Um, it gets a little less by the, the uh, 1990 cohort. It gets a little less by the 2000 cohort. It's getting more and more, more and more discrepant as we go across these 10 year periods to the point where they think that those people who were 25 to 34 in 2010 have only about a 75% chance of becoming of getting married at some point as opposed to in the old days it was more like 95% chance. So marriage is becoming much less common. Um, in fact if we look at those people who have never been married in 2012 and we break it down by race we see that the whites are the most likely followed by Asians to get married followed by Hispanics, which are less likely, and then the least likely are blacks to have been married or to get married. So by race, there seems to be differences in the value of marriage um, in you know the modern era. Here we have another uh, chart, and this one is depicting the probability of, of marriage based on whether you have a high school diploma or less versus if you have a bachelor's degree or more. And in the olden days, you know, the 1960s, people with high school diplomas were more likely to get married than people with college degrees. But as of 1993-ish, that flipped. And today, you're much more likely to get married if you have a college degree than if you don't. Um, but still, it's only a 50% per, um, probability of, of marriage um, in this chart. So how about cumulative percentage by age? Um, so by age 20, about 8% of men and about 12% of women are married by age 20. And then it's, you know, accumulating, accumulating by age 30, about 70% of women and about 55% of men are married. By the age of 40, we're looking at about 85% of women and about 78% of men that are married. So we're not topping out in the 90s like we once did, but most people will get married at some point in their lives. Now here's an encouragement to get married. The most satisfying sex lives are those reported by married couples. Um, this is again from that National Survey of Sexual Behavior that I've been quoting this whole chapter. Um, so if we look at married people in the light blue bars versus the unmarried people in the dark blue bars, um, married people are much more likely to say that they've had sex in the past year. Um, and they're much more likely to say that they've had two to th sex two to three times a week. Um, so more frequent sex, if that if frequency determines satisfaction, right? Um, based on a blog from Psychology Today, we have some interesting um, hypotheses about marriage and satisfying sex lives. Of course, having a partner who's there all the time and lives in the same household and stuff like that makes it really com convenient to have sex with each other. Um, the longer you know a person, the more you can understand their cues and their um, their signs of interest, right? So that you are less likely to miss an opportunity. You're less likely to try when it's an inappropriate time. Um, there's safety from infection, which really can help um, make people relax and have more fun when they're having sex. Um, 
this is of course assuming both partners are monogamous, right? There's a lower risk of rejection. I mean, you might say, hey, honey, you want to have sex tonight? And they might say, no, I'm just really tired tonight. But it's not the same kind of rejection as, you know, you might experience if you're out on the singles market and you finally muster up your courage and, you know, try and get that person to go home with you. And they're like, ah, no. And I mean, it's like a personal rejection as opposed to in marriage. It's more like not right now. I've chosen you for my whole life, but not right now. Um, And then freedom to risk and experiment. You know, when you feel like you're comfortable and that you're not going to get rejected and that, you know, the person is committed to you, uh, you can take risks that you can't with a stranger who, you know, might say that they never want to see you again after you've suggested this idea that you've come up with. So that may contribute to greater satisfaction as people get to try out stuff that they, that they want to. Unfortunately, marriage sometimes leads to divorce. And so divorce... Uh, I've got kind of some weird data here um, because see how we've got the first marriage in the light bar and we've got a second marriage in the in the in the darker bar and they don't really kind of overlap because um, they start collecting the data on the mar- first marriage after five years and they start collecting the data on the second marriage after one year so the li- the lines don't completely match up. If we just look at the five year point um, on first marriages your probability of divorcing by five years is about 20%. On a second marriage, it's more like 30% that you'll you'll divorce within five years. If we go to 10 years, the probability of a first marriage ending in divorce is about 32%. Second marriage, it's more like 47%. So, you know, the second marriage is uh, riskier or less stable than a first marriage. Your best chance for stability is the first marriage. So it's really important to pick carefully and um, you know make sure that the that you that you're on the same page and that you're committing for the same reasons, right? Um, the probability of divorce across a 20-year period. This is the most current data I could find. It suggests that a first marriage, it's less than a 50% chance of divorce over the course of a 20-year marriage. Um, if we look, if we break down based on whether the couple lived together before they got married or not, this is a really interesting piece of data for the cohabitors who think it's a way to test um, and make make for a more stable marriage. Couples who didn't cohabit before they got married are in the left bar. If they cohabited for some period of time, went through a formal engagement process and a formal um, elaborate marriage process, they're in the middle. And on the right-hand side is people who cohabited, they never really had a formal engagement, they just um, sort of moved into marriage. And what you see is the percent of divorce. And those couples who co- who did not cohabit before marriage had the lower lowest rate of divorce, about 28%. Those who cohabited first and had a big elaborate um, engagement and process transitioning themselves from cohabitation into marriage formally had a, about a 33% chance of divorce, and whereas the ones who cohabited and then just sort of got married had almost a 40% chance of divorcing within 10 years. So when we parse everything out, we see sort of a different pattern where cohabitation um, can be, uh, well, it's it produces a, a less stable marriage no matter what, but it can be uh, less impactful on the stability of the, of the marriage if uh, the transition from cohabitation into this new status in life is a big formal celebration of we're moving into this commitment that we're both invested in and stuff like that. A lot of co- couples who cohabitate when they're asked, why are you cohabitating? Why don't you just get married? They'll say marriage is just a piece of paper. Couples who have that attitude, regardless of whatever else they do, um, do have less stable marriages. If you view marriage as a piece of paper, then yeah, it's not surprising that it's a less stable marriage. Okay, it's a good time to take a break. Let's come back and we'll talk about sexuality and aging in the next segment.